Vitex Degundo is the most productive nectar plant you can grow, in my opinion, in a temperate climate such as Zone 7. Here, it's only been four weeks since frost or uh, dormancy, and I already have flower blossoms on this, and it's going to continue to bloom constantly until fall when the frost comes. The Vitex Degundo plants get really big. Um, and they're perennial. They last for many, many, many years. I don't know how long they last, but they get really large, um, like small trees. And they can grow in partial shade just fine, um, or in full sun as these are. And what I really like most about them is that the bees really like them. That if you add a little bit of water to the blooms in the summertime, when it's hot and dry, the bees really get on them and they get a lot of nectar out of them. And they bloom when nothing else blooms. As I said before, Vitex Degundo starts blooming as soon as it gets long enough shoots to recover from the winter dormancy period. As you can see, I've already got flower blooms on these. And they'll be blooming until frost. And as Vitex Degundo goes, whatever you do, don't be confused with other kinds of Vitex. Vitex agnus castus doesn't seem to be very liked by bees. I don't know why, but I've got a plant of that, actually two, and the bees don't seem to get on them. Anyway, this right here is autumn olive. Russian olive is the same. They're all varieties um, that are similar. They got many names, but as you can see what it is, this plant is one of the best early spring nectar plants. It's really productive and has a wonderful smell. Afterwards, the blooms fall, which are bell-shaped. Then you have these little bitty fruits, which at the moment they're gray. But when they start turning an orange, yellowish, or reddish, they're ready to eat. And they're tart, and the seed is soft enough to be able to crush and eat. And in Asia and parts of Europe, they're a delicacy. They're loved and eaten quite often. Well, here we like TV dinners and fast food, so Americans don't really eat them. We call them uh, invasive species because they don't need agrochemical uh, poisons to thrive and chemicals. But I've got them beside my roads and man are they good for bees and wildlife. They are great. Plus they actually say that they put nitrogen in the soil, fix the nitrogen they do from the atmosphere. And if that's true then they make the soil much more productive. Um, anyway, I've got them for the bees in early spring. And I've got lots of Vitex plants because they provide year-round nectar. See right there, that's a spike of a bloom coming out. And it's only been four or five weeks since the last freeze. Um, roses are pretty good, but the wild rose only blooms for about a week. But while it's blooming, it's all right. It certainly doesn't bloom as long as the autumn olive or the Russian olive. That stuff blooms for like three or four weeks after the frost is over. It just quit blooming. And see, here's the roses. They've already stopped blooming and are already making their little fruity hips for the animals. So that's the end of that one. Um, so roses really don't seem to be a good type. But here we have another species of wild rose and it's just about to bloom. So it's a new type. It's, it's going to bloom uh, at a different time than the other roses. So it's good to have a lot of different species exotic species as well from different parts of the earth so that you'll have food and blooms at all year round for the animals and the insects. So I've got many species of wild roses. Um, they're native to Europe and North America. This is sassafras and it only blooms for a few days and it's really not so great. Anyway, privet. Privet is one of the best. Privet around here has the heaviest nectar flow um, right about the time when the bees really need it to build comb and right now my honeybees are nectar bound from the privet I'll show you You probably can't see the top so I'll have to bring them down. Oh, yeah, there's one close enough the privet just stopped blooming and See here. This was covered in white blooms now. It's got the little tiny berries on it but it was covered in white blooms the bees were all over it and the bees were bringing in so much nectar, the queen had no room to lay. They were building so many combs, the combs were getting so fat I couldn't even open up the frames. And that's privet for you. Privet is a really good bee plant. Um, of course, my number one favorite is still Vitex Nagundo because it continues to bloom. As you see, the privet's over with. It's done for. But 
I couldn't live without this stuff. Privet. Um, now here, hot and summery, you're going to get your long bloom of honeysuckle. Now there's been myths. Back in the 70s, they used to sell what they called carnio, or Caucasian bees. They claimed that their tongues were longer and they could reach into the honeysuckle and get nectar from it and no other bee could, which was a lie. Um, they're all the same, the Apis meriliflares. Um, just a little color variations. They all measure the same. You check it out. Um, anyhow, whoop, there goes a the bee. Um, they, uh, they don't have to go down into the tube to get to the nectar. That just pollinates them, and honey, hummingbirds do that. The bee just has to lick the, the flower. The, the plant itself is full of nectar just on the... There's superfluous nectaries all over this honeysuckle flower here, and that's all they have to do. You'll get quite a flow now that's going from this honeysuckle, which is growing everywhere. And it's, it grows well. It's from Japan, and it's a wonderful thing to have. Um, all winter, it stays green, and without it, a lot of our deer would, and uh, herbivorous animals would starve because privet and honeysuckle are evergreens. And honeysuckle even grows in the, in the winter, so you can graze it back, and on warm winter days, it'll start growing again. So honeysuckle is a great bee plant. Another really good bee plant is burr clover, or also, I think, ball clover. It's the little yellow pom-pom-like clover that you're seeing, and it provides a lot of nectar for quite a long period of time in your pastures. And it makes a little burrish like seed head that sticks to the fur of the animals and is spread. It fixes good nitrogen into the soil and helps other clovers grow. One uh, more permanent clover is white clover. White clover is one of my favorites because it blooms all summer as long as there is moisture. And when it gets really hot though, it does stop blooming. Bees love it and it's permanent and it crawls across the ground. So even if it's mowed low, it can still thrive. It fixes nitrogen for the grasses and other plants. It, it makes the soil rich, everything eats it and honeybees dearly love it. And one of the most things that is great about white clover is that it's higher in protein than grasses. Livestock and animals really gain weight from it. So full of protein, rich in protein. And it grows in the winter when grasses, when most grasses don't. So like if you have a warm season grass like Bermuda um, or St. Augustine or something, the white clover will grow in it and give it nitrogen and then when it dies back, the Bermuda dies in the fall or uh, early spring, it's not alive yet, the, or awake yet, the whole tops are dead to the ground of, of uh, Bermuda and the clover grows among it inside the dead Bermuda and just really thrives, provides food for the animals in the winter. Of course, uh, in the deep winter, nothing is growing. That's the truth about the pasture. Now this is calla mint, and it really is a nice smelling mint. All mints, as far as I think, all mints are very, very loved by bees. Mints are good for bees too. Menthol is known as a miticide, so it helps with tracheal mite, and it helps with varroa mite, varroa destructor mite. You don't have to worry about varroa jacobsoni. We don't have that one, but varroa jacobsoni is a tropical mite that only thrives on drones. Anyway, we got Varroa Destructor we've got to worry about. Menthol is a great thing for it, and all mint plants contain menthol. So, you should encourage mints in your pastures. Animals don't eat the mint, but it's good. You can always mow it. Now, Echinacea is not really a bee plant. Echinacea is good for butterflies, but bees aren't really fond of it. The seeds that Echinacea makes, though, are great for bird seed. See, wasps aren't all bad. Here's a wasp, and it's pollinating. It's doing its job as a pollinator as well. See that? It's pollinating the clover. So the bees will have plenty of seeds for more clover to sprout. This right here is white Dutch clover. There's another form called Ladino, which is taller and has a little bit more orange in its blossom. Anyhow, my favorite plant in your pasture is clover. No one should ever get rid of their clover. Do not use herbicides, you'll lose your clover. Walking out to the bee yard. 
I keep it in the shade as much as I can because it's too hot here. Oh, a deer. Hey, deer. See the deer? Running free. Don't run too far, baby. It's safe here. It's not safe anywhere else. Got a lot of exterminators. They watch television and they want to be rednecks. And they're taught by TV because it's run by sporting industries that you're supposed to exterminate everything you see and buy your sporting goods at your local Walmart store. And their heroes are Jeff Foxworthy, a uh, computer programmer from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, not even a country boy at all, but they look to him as if he's going to teach them how to be a redneck. Well, if a redneck's an animal exterminator, that just wants to destroy everything that's in the wilderness and wants to make it all into a big city and devoid of animals and uses herbicides and has a manicured lawn. I don't want to be a redneck. I'm a hillbilly. That's all I am. I want to live with nature. I want to live with the animals. When I see somebody exterminate one of these animals, it's one of my pets. I've been living with it. I don't kill it. Besides that, I'm a vegetarian. You don't need to eat meat. I'm telling you right now, you don't need to eat meat. I've never eaten it. I'm in perfect health. I'm athletic, and I do not touch that dead carcass of a cadaver. Anything you eat in this called meat is really just a cadaver. Anyway, I want to show you these these bees. Right now, they're they're slowing down, as you can see. They're not going really fast because I can walk in front of them because they are no longer on a nectar flow. The reason is they have, uh, the privet has quit blooming and it was so heavy that they got honey bound. I just got a snake skin, yeah. Um, their snakes are living underneath this mat eating the mice that will get in the hives in the winter and that is good for the bees. Um, I got these mats down under the hives because hive beetles have to pupate in the soil. So they fall on the mat and the lizards eat the larvae. They never make it to the soil in time to pupate. I've got all kinds of enemies against the hive beetle. One, I've got many kinds of lizards that I keep around the hives. And they don't like getting stung so they don't mess with the bees. But they crawl around and they eat the hive beetles. Sometimes they'll eat a drone. I've not seen that. I just see them eating hive beetles and larvae, things like that. Anyway, I don't see any lizards right now, but if I looked long enough, I would. And oh, shade is very important. You'll hear people tell you, oh, you'll get hive beetles if you put your hives in the shade. So funny. You read it one time on the computer and everybody's saying it like it's true. You'll hear, Russian bees don't sting, they headbutt. Who wrote that? They sting, they're just bees. Apis mellifera bees have stingers, they sting. Um, Russian bees are just Apis mellifera bees. The first Russian bees that we brought here were from Yugoslavia, they were called Yugos. And those were beautiful gray carniolan bees. They were different, they were small. But then they sold out, the USDA sold it out to private individuals who then claimed they got the Russian bees from Pomorsky way out in Siberia near the tundra, which I really doubt that. That's an advertisement spiel. It's just a bunch of old uh, Louisiana mutts that have taken over the old USDA apiary. I'm sure that all the carniolan is bred clean out of them and I don't think they ever went to Pomorskia to pick up any Russian traits. They just look to me like plain old Louisiana yellow bees, Italians. In the United States, all of our bees are generally the same. We'll have different colored queens, but you're not going to find another different colored worker. Um, you see, all my hives right there are all yellowish, except for the queens. Now they vary. But this is the color of your bees as well. You're not going to find bees that are all gray in there or all black. That's only in books. You see, my drones are black. But in books, you're going to read, oh, the Carniolans are all gray and the Italians are all yellow. No, our bees are all mutts now. We're not artificially inseminating. We're just um, breeding and keeping them alive in our hives with medicines. And the wild bees that we had once here, the black bees, which are native to Europe and America, the Apis mellifera, elef Apis mellifera mellifera is gone. There's no more black bees in North America. We imported 
Italians in 1857. That's the yellow bee we have now. But prior to that, we had black bees we took for granted, and we said, oh, they're no good uh, because they're too aggressive. And so we had them clean up till about 30 years ago. When I was younger, I used to catch them out of the forests, and uh, nobody really wanted them. They were smaller. We didn't realize the reason they were smaller was because they were on their own combs. They were building their own combs. No one wanted to keep the blacks. We kept the Italians. And we would say that um, through artificial insemination, we can get different colors. And we had them. We had different colors. But now you can't buy black bees. You can't buy um, mountain gray, Caucasian um, bees. You can't buy gray carniolans. We just get, um, and look at the advertisements on the computer and you'll see what I'm saying. It'll say carniolan bee and then look at the picture. The workers beside them are just yellow. Just like these. And the Italians will look the same. And they'll even show you carniolan queens for sale and the queen will be yellow sometimes. But sometimes she'll be black. But like I said, we don't have any races anymore in the United States. We haven't anything but mutts. You don't know what color the queens are going to be in any of our hives anymore, but we know for sure that our workers are going to be a yellowish bunch. Every once in a while there'll be one black bee in with about 30 of the yellows or maybe a 5% of gray bees, maybe 20% gray bees, but we're not going to have a whole bunch of nothing but gray and nothing but black bees in a hive anymore. Even in the forest, you're not going to find those black bees in the trees like I used to. They're gone. The mites have killed off all the wild bees. And I can't stand the term feral bee. Feral is a bad word, and it means an animal from a foreign country that's come along and taken over the wild and is causing trouble. That is not true. The wild bee is wild in North America because we did have black bees in North America. We had them when we first, Europeans first came here. Indians have all kinds of stories of raising bees and logs. Um, the prairie Indians, of course, the prairie Americans did not have bees because there's no place for them to live on the prairies. And uh, you can't keep honeybees without trees. Anyway, I want to show you some more uh, nectar plants. Now these are basswood trees. They're called basswood, but they're native to Europe and North America. They're also known as linden trees, or also known as lime trees in England. Linden. Um, there's little leaf linden and bigger leaf linden, but really they're the same, same thing, just a little variation in leaf size. But what I love about them is the honeybees are developed to live with them. They develop about the same time as honeybees. They they defend. I mean, they depend completely on the honeybee for pollination. The honeybee is the main pollinator for sure. Now you see all these little, little things underneath them. These are going to all be flowers in about a week. They're all going to be blooming. There's just a couple blooming now, but it's going to be so covered in bees it's going to sound like a swarm almost. Of course, the swarm sound comes from the drones that are flying in it, mating with the queens. Um, the princess queens are getting mated by the drones and become queens, and then they fly back into the hive and hopefully find other hives if they're lucky and don't all uh, fight to the death. But anyway, this is going to be covered in bees. It's known as a basswood. They used to use basswood to uh, fill the gaps in ships and um, keep them from leaking when they mixed them with tar and stuff. And um, many of the basswoods were cut down for making fishing lures in North America. One of them was the jitterbug. Unfortunately, there's not many of the basswoods left. But this is a pretty good nature's honey plant, and they grow pretty quickly. They don't transplant well. I've tried to transplant them and have been unlucky. I have to go ahead and let them grow in the pasture and protect them. Um, but they don't bloom very long, about a week. Sometimes as long as a week and a half. Um, but the bloom is very heavy, and they really fill up the supers fast. Of course, all my brood boxes are the same. I'm an... Uh, unlimited brood box guy and I also am foundationless so I don't have supers I just have brood boxes that I fill with honey and um, that's a basswood one of the best trees for nectar production in June now elm trees are really good for nectar many times of the year they put out a lot of nectar flowers you can't see them very well they're slightly flattened and disc-shaped, disc disc-shaped, 
and uh, the bees will be all over an elm. And one of my favorite vines is Virginia creeper. Uh, a lot of people who don't have any sense call Virginia creeper poison oak, but it's not in the family of Rustoxica. It is not a poison ivy or poison oak, which is basically the same vine. It is not that. Virginia creeper does not have dermatitis causing agents in it. As a matter of fact, you can actually eat the fruits and the leaves. And uh, I'm going to show you some of that in the forest. If I can find it, it's not my forest, this is the animal's forest. But I'm here to protect it, I guess. Okay. Here's a Virginia creeper vine. Oh, just before I get to that, this is a really good plant. This is called gill over the ground, also known as ground ivy. It's in the mint family, and it's really delicious. Um, they used to use it for hops in the olden days, before they had the vining hops. This was the first beer hops. The Vikings used it for hops. Um, it has a blue mint-like flower, and the bees get all over it all over it. If I could find some in the sun, I would show you. This is where my horse always finds a sapling to dance on. She is funny. Here is some Virginia creeper. It has five leaves, not three like poison oak and poison ivy. And it blooms in the summer. And man, do they get all over it. Now up there at the top, that's poison ivy. See the three-leafed plant? That up there that's flying out a little farther, that's all poison ivy, which I don't get anyway. But this is poison, okay, here is, this is Virginia creeper, and this is poison ivy. See the difference? Oh no, is that a sprayer? My nightmare, it might be a sprayer. Let me see, a tractor's going by down the highway. No, it's not a sprayer, it's a tedder. He's just harvesting his hay for now. But he might go crazy and start sh spraying for army worms, which he imagines, and then I'll have some dead bees on my hands again. Okay, so that's Virginia Creeper. Now let me try to find you some gill over the ground that's in bloom. Might just be a not blooming right now. But when it's blooming, you can tell because it's humming with bees. Now it's not blooming right now. But you see what it looks like. And it has a little blue flower. Sorry I can't show it to you. This is a muscadine. And um, it has flowers. The bees don't really get on them much. And here's what the flowers look like. They're just about to open. Little clusters, kind of like a grape um, bunch. They bloom. And basically hoverflies are what pollinate them. And I find that the hoverflies also eat aphids. And one of the great things about aphids are that they eat the tips of the muscadine only. They don't eat any other part. And you need the tips of the muscadine pinched so that it'll keep its energy down near the spur and provide more food for the developing clusters of grapes. You don't want the vines to just keep on trying to reach up to the trees because there'd be very little fruit. And so you really want them pinched. They want to go along the pinched tips. I got dirt all over my hands. Anyway, people use the tips of it. I have not seen on the internet, but they use the tips for tea. And I really don't know why, but it is a little bitter of a tea. It's kind of sourish with a little sugar in it even. It's not bad, a little muscadine tip tea. But you're supposed to tip your muscadines so that they provide the energy for these fruits. And uh, I just don't have the time to walk all the way down these hundreds of feet of muscadines that I planted and get them all tipped. But sometimes I just go ahead when I'm bored and I do it. Um, this is going to be a pretty good year for my pecans. I tried to graft a few and unfortunately not one of my grafts took. It was totally unsuccessful, and what's sad is that I, I sawed down some of my smaller nut trees because I thought they would provide bigger nuts, but now I wish I had enough since I cut them back 
because the littler nuts would have provided the wildlife with an easier to eat nut. It wouldn't be so big since things like turkeys don't shell the nut. They have to swallow them whole. It would be a lot better if I gave some of the smaller nuts for the turkeys. And also other animals swallow the nuts whole. And uh, like deer, they need to put the whole nut in their mouth so they can crunch it. So I really would like not to have had all my nut trees to be big. Now I've hindsight is is uh, 50 is 2020. Unfortunately, I would have still not been so upset if they had have taken, but the grafts didn't. I just cut the tree back to nothing, and now I've got stumps that have to regrow. Anyway, this is huzu bamboo, also known as pigskin bamboo, and the reason is. It feels like pig's skin when you touch it. Just like a football, it has little dimples in it. That's why they call it that. Maybe also because the husk looks quite a bit when it's first starting out like this. The husk looks like pig's skin. Um, anyway, when it's fully developed, it becomes this color. This is several years old. Now this bamboo is awesome because it never makes the mistake in zone 7 of coming up too soon in the springtime. All my other bamboos come up before the frosts are over with and then they'll be looking really good and they'll be so proud of the shoots and really looking hopeful and then a frost will come and kill most of them back. But with the huzu, it knows to wait until frost is over. It's the last bamboo in zone 7 to send up its shoots. And this is all very important because bamboo only shoots once every spring and it only grows for about four weeks maybe five and it stops growing and it stays evergreen and only produces leaves and doesn't put out any more shoots till the next year so if you lose that mess of shoots it seriously slows your bamboo down and cuts it back it makes the shoots not as big next time and it's just not a good thing and one thing about bamboo It'll put out more shoots than it's going to use, and it'll kill its extra shoots. Um, like this one put out a lot of shoots, and none of them were destroyed by frost. They never are here. And here's one that's being killed. See, it's killing its own shoot. See how it's turning yellow right here? That shoot is literally aborting itself. It's changing its mind on the mission. And they do that. There's more that just did that. This one did that. See, this shoot, it just died. It just flipped right over because it gave up on growing because it has enough shoots. There's more over there that are doing the same thing. So that's that. And as far as more, more nectar plants, there's one more nectar plant that's really nice. It's called water willow. It's not this willow tree. It's a low growing plant that grows in the creeks. It's not even in the willow family. This is a pond that is full of tadpoles. And tadpoles are great because tadpoles and pollywogs eat mosquito larvae. So there's no mosquitoes. If you happen to have a bucket with mosquito larvae in it, put a couple tadpoles in there. You'll notice in a couple days, there'll never be any more mosquito larvae in that bucket. They are predators if they were given the chance. Tadpoles eat. The wigglers of mosquitoes. Um, I always keep a few buckets around just for the tree frogs so they can have a place to have their babies because tree frogs depended on the old tree crotches we used to have before we lived here and logged everything off. There were lots of dead trees that had crotches that caught water. These are gone. Never overestimate uh, or underestimate the greatness of white clover. See this white clover? This is my favorite plant. Of pastures okay I, I think I've got enough talk I've talked to you guys enough I just wanted to say it's about time for the elephant garlic to be harvested see the flowers on the top of the elephant garlic well once you have flowers when they fade it's time to dig it up so it's almost time to dig up my elephant garlic and like I said before I grow my elephant garlic right out in my pasture because the horses don't eat it. And it's a great thing to have around because it's a, a trustworthy supply of food. These little pom-poms, these are elephant garlics. Aren't they beautiful? I plant them in the fall 
and I dig them up in June. About June, June 5th, I'll be digging these up and I'll be eating them. Um, you have to let them dry first and cure for a few weeks and then the dirt falls off and then you rub them with your hands, get the root cut off and the top cut off and store them all year in the house and eat off of them. And what's left in the fall, you go ahead and replant in the pastures and stuff. And they grow all winter long, even though it's cold. Here's my mistake. I cut this small netted tree down and I grafted it and it was a failure. So sad, I'm so sorry tree. I'm so sorry. What can I do now? Nothing. But all is not lost. This uh, little section here is still alive. And the other one too has lower branches. So I might try again next year and I might just appreciate what I have on it. I've got plenty of other pecan trees. Plenty. Here's some more of that white clover. Yes, I love to see white clover. Everyone should have it. Everyone. Lawns should be nothing but white clover. All right. I'm so sorry. I can't stop. Basswood. Huge tree. Basswood. Big tree with all kinds of blossoms just waiting to start blooming. Aren't the bees ecstatic? They will be happy. My yellow groove grove. It feels such a nice microclimate in here. Once bamboo makes a microclimate, it is the most comfortable feeling. It's the right temperature. You can hear the birds singing. The breeze is beautiful. It absorbs sound in its hollow chambers. Underneath it, it makes a leaf litter that makes good topsoil. It catches erosion. It's really nice. It makes oxygen from carbon dioxide. Of course, the major player in that is phytoplankton in the oceans. Phytoplankton are the lungs of the earth and herbicides are killing them, creating dead zones in the oceans and starving the coral to death. Coral eat phytoplankton plants, but the agrochemical corporations are hiding the fact that the dead zones are created by herbicides. They call it nutrient overload, but that's not true. We've never had dead zones before, and we used to have more nutrient overload than now because we used to not have sewer treatment plants. And we used to dump raw sewage into our rivers, and there used to be hundreds of millions of bison in North America that migrated all in one big swoop. And uh, the spring rains used to wash their manure straight into the Gulf of Mexico, and it was abundant with fish. Abundant. Now, the oceans are dying because of herbicide. All our alligators are poached out. People have watched that reality fake TV shows and everybody wants to kill the alligators and they've all done it. They're all dead. Killing the alligators out. All the shows on television are about killing all the animals off. Everyone wants to be an exterminator. They want to exterminate wildlife. They say that's what is so uh, important is to make sure you're a wildlife exterminator. But I'm a hillbilly and I don't believe in wildlife extermination. As a matter of fact, I don't like the term redneck because it seems to be what the Hollywood people um, call someone that they have created with their computer programmer, Jeff Foxworthy from Atlanta, Georgia. And they call him 
a redneck, but he says he knows what rednecks are, but how would he know? He's a computer nerd. I don't like the rednecks I'm eating now. They kill everything that they look at and they ruin the they ruin the wilderness. They want to they want to destroy the wilderness. They don't want to protect anything. They get all their info from corporate television, which is nothing but an advertisement. Uh oh. I gotta get my horse's fly masks off this evening. Hey girls, they want something. What you up to?